Thank you, Mayor Thompson. <laughs> All right. Uh, first up today, we have uh, Dave uh, Silverman, I'm, I'm, who probably needs no introduction, but uh, he's the president of American Atheists, and uh, they've been doing a fantastic job over there, and uh, I, uh, I, I'm anxious to... Uh, uh, you, you need, you need there is connect over here. There's a connect over there. Over there. Sure. Just a few uh, words to the wise here. Uh, if anybody is parked in the city parking garage across the street, be aware that on the weekends they close early and you really can't get your car out, okay, uh, after a particular hour. I don't know the exact hour, 7 o'clock yesterday. 7 o'clock, uh, okay, so uh, uh, street parking at meters on the weekend is, is free. I, I know she doesn't want me to promote that it's free, <laughs> but it is free. And then also uh, the, uh, the Brady, uh, parking garage of the hospital. They have two garages over there. Uh, the main garage, they still charge and everything, but but uh, the Brady garage, which is a block south, it's on Mary Street. Um, that's during the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, is, is open to all. And we just tested that out with our family's cars over there. A uh, couple other things, cell phones, please put it at least on vibrate, if not off. And um, I do want to remind people that if anybody is local to the area or is going to be staying into Monday, uh, PA Nonbelievers is going to have a table at the Capitol. We do this every once in a while. And um, uh, you're invited to join us uh, at our table. It'll be in the East Rotunda of the Capitol pretty much from about 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. Uh, if you're not able to stay, you're going to come down uh, on Monday if you got to work. If your organization has any kind of uh, uh, handouts that you would like us to have on our table, uh, we will try to do that. Uh, we, we don't get into political stuff uh, because we're 501c3, but uh, any actual, you know, uh, uh, organizational information uh, is uh, certainly uh, uh, welcome. We can take it with us. Uh, the other thing is that uh, this uh, field trip tomorrow down to DC. Uh, is with Mike Newdow. Mike Newdow should be arriving um, early this afternoon. And Mike, if, for those of you who do not, don't not, do not know, he is the uh, emergency room doctor and attorney and activist who did um, um, take the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States Supreme Court. He has ongoing cases against uh, the national motto and the Pledge of Allegiance in lower courts. Uh, and uh, he'll, be, he'll be our guest speaker tonight after dinner. Uh, remember that uh, even if you do not have dinner tickets, and we are sold out of the dinner tickets at this point, uh, we'll let you know if any further come, become available. But uh, while, uh, uh, you know, that the dinner is for ticket holders, uh, we will open the doors after dinner at about 6 o'clock for Mike Newdow, who uh, I believe will be uh, actually doing a combination talk, and he's also sort of a folk singer, so he and, uh, and uh, uh, Dan Barker, I think, will be accompanying uh, Mike uh, on uh, on the keyboard, I suppose, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Any other? Uh, does anybody? Are, are we ready? Uh, any, any any important uh, things that anybody here wants to get across to the crowd? Any problems? Questions? Okay. Dave will be ready in just a moment. We're first talk of the day and. You know, all the issues uh, involved, make sure everything's up and ready to go. In other words, Dave's ready now. <laughs> <laughs> We're just waiting for the technology to get it together. <laughs> Dave's been ready since his drive over from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. This is a good time to meet everybody. Right. Like, I'm back in Harrisburg. I used to live in Harrisburg a couple of years ago or a uh, decade ago or so. Um, it's always great to come back. I want to thank uh, Carl and Brian for bringing, up, uh, bringing me up here and uh, starting this event. And I also want to thank Mayor Linda Thompson who saw me coming and ran out. Uh, 
But uh, you know, it must have been tough for uh, Mary Thompson to come here, um, our, bearing in mind our differences. And I really do appreciate that she did that. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little story today about this rally thing that happened. We had a rally. And, and I want to give you a little bit of a picture of what happened at the rally, at the Reason Rally, which was uh, uh, a pretty good size event. Uh, it happened earlier this year. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, well, we hope it will be a watershed event for the movement, uh, and maybe even uh, the first uh, such event, not only the only event. Uh, it was called the Reason Rally, and it was just the beginning, and that's the reason why that's uh, why I'm calling it that. Now, here's my friend. He looks a lot like Jesus, so we put him on the so uh, we put him in front of a blue screen and took some pictures of him. So the Reason Rally is over. Now what? First things we want to talk about is uh, what did the Reason Rally accomplish? What did it set out to accomplish, and did it succeed? I got some cool pictures. I was backstage for the whole Reason Rally. I got some good pictures. Um, what has American Atheists accomplished, and what's the relationship between American Atheists and the Reason Rally? Uh, I want to make sure that that point was made clear. I want to follow up on how young atheists are leading the way, and why that makes such a difference. I have a video to show you. Uh, hopefully I'll have time to do that. I've got 45 minutes, and I've got Brian here who's going to start throwing stuff at me if I go too long. Uh, but I do have a, an eight minute video that I'd like to share with you. Um, but before I do that, let's get into what the Reason Rally accomplished. Now, a lot of people look at the Reason Rally and they say, okay, the objective was to raise the awareness of the atheist, uh, of the atheist movement to the atheist population. I think that's number one, right? Last night here at the hotel, I went downstairs to a bar and I sat next to a stranger as you do at a bar, and she asked me in a, in a course of casual conversation, why are you here? And I said, well, I'm here for an atheist convention. And she said, an atheist convention? And I said, yeah, we've got an entire organization right here in Pennsylvania, and uh, we're throwing a convention. And she said, really? <laughs> she had no idea that the movement existed. She had no idea that the movement existed. She was an atheist. In fact, she might be in this room. Are you in this room? I think her name was Jan. No. She um, had no idea that the movement existed. In this movement, there are 40 to 50,000 atheists in the movement. That's all of American atheists, all of PA non-believers, all of FFRF combined, estimated about 50,000 people. This country, is about 16% atheist, 16% non-believer, which I call an atheist because it's true. <laughs> That's over 50 million people, and that means that the number of people in the movement are 0.1% of the population. A lot of people say, well, what are you trying to do? You're trying to convert people to atheism. No, that's not, the, that's not the idea, that's not what we need to do. What we need to do is raise the awareness of the atheist movement to the atheist population. They don't even know we're there. No matter how much we yell, no matter how much we scream, there's still a huge portion of the atheist population that doesn't know we exist. They still think we're alone. And if they knew we existed, they would join us right away. So the number one purpose of the Reason Rally was to raise awareness of the, atheist pop, of the atheist movement to the atheist population by bringing in stars like Eddie Izzard and Tim Minchin and, and Adam Savage and Paul Provenza. The, the achievement for, this, for the rally, now again, remember that number I told you, 50,000 in the movement, the Reason Rally had 30,000 people. Those were not all the people from the movement. That's a lot of new people. It's a lot of new faces that we brought into the movement in one event. That was our primary objective, and it, I, I think it was satisfied in, in, in by far. 
The second uh, objective, to raise the awareness of the atheists in the population at large. Anybody hear anybody saying, oh, there's no such thing as atheists anytime recently? That has gone down. We used to get that a lot, right? I've never met an atheist. I've never met anybody. I didn't, I've never met any atheists. I don't get that too often anymore. And that is because the reason rally was covered by CNN, MSNBC, The New York Times, USA Today, NBC, CBS, ABC, all the major networks had something on the Reason Rally, and the people were talking about it on the news and on the blogs. And you know what? We raised some serious awareness on that day. You get 30,000 people, dot, 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 in the rain. Those three dots, dot, 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 in the rain. That's three important, that, that's, that's an important point out there. 30,000 people in the rain in Washington, D.C. That was a heck of an accomplishment. Third objective is to unite the movement to facilitate future cooperation. So here's something very important. Those of you who have been in the movement for a long time will remember a time when the organizations inside the movement didn't get along all that well. They didn't get along all that well. They threw stones at each other, and they didn't like each other. The reason rally was the first time ever that American atheists and CSH, and the Council for Secular Humanism, and the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and the American Humanist Association, and all the other national organizations put money on the table behind a common banner toward a common goal. And we showed the movement, but also we showed ourselves that we could do it. We showed the movement and we showed ourselves that we could do it and succeed wildly. This was, frankly, the most difficult part of the convention, of the, of the rally, but it also was the biggest victory. Because if we can do that, we can do it again. And that's the big picture here. The big picture here is that all everybody worked together with no shtick. Even behind closed doors, even during the board meetings, there was no shtick from anybody. We all got along. We all worked together. We all congratulated each other. We had a good time behind closed doors as well as at the rally. And that means that you're going to be seeing that kind of cooperation again. Now, cool pictures. Because <laughs> that's what you came to see, right? Cool pictures. Check out this, photo, this picture. This is a great picture. This is. 2,500 happy atheists with big signs and, and, and big smiles right in front of the, on the Washington Mall. 2,500 atheists in 2002. That was, at the time, the largest atheist gathering in world history. This is what happened in March. Look at that. That gamma out times 10. 10 times larger. This picture, I don't know if you can see it well. Those tents in the back, the crowd goes up to the sides of those tents. Not behind, but up to the sides of those tents. 30,000 people in the rain waiting to hear everybody. That's Richard Dawkins waving his hand. He had a real good time. But there's more. This is, whoops, this is 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning. The reason why they started at 10, this was at 8 o'clock in the morning. You can see the crowd is already huge. This is when we realized what we had going on. At 8 o'clock in the morning, we had this kind of a crowd. This is when we realized what was going on. Then Tim mentioned, that's where I stood for 10 minutes, for 10 minutes. I took that picture off my camera phone and was very happy with that scene. Uh, let's see. This picture has uh, Tim Minchin, Indra Zuno, Eddie Izzard, Jamila Bay, PZ Myers in the hat, that person in front is Jamie Kilstein, all in back. They had this little powwow going on there for a while. Bad Religion, K 
came and rocked the house. We had a mosh pit at the Reason Rally. Okay? That's fun. That was, it, it, it's, it's not fun until the mosh pit forms, right? It's not a party until the mosh pit forms. And we had a mosh pit in front of the Reason Rally for Bad Religions who came out and, um, and rocked the house for 45 minutes. James Randi, Eddie Izzard, and of course Richard. I love this picture because I've got the mean face over on the left and it looks like Richard is talking to the mean face, so I took that picture. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about American Atheists just a bit. Now, American Atheist was founded in 1963 by Madeline Murray O'Hare. And she did that by starting, uh, she started it all by taking, for, by suing and successfully suing at the Supreme Court to take forced Christian prayer out of the public schools. Then that was not 49 years ago. Hint, hint. That was 49 years ago. Almost 50 years. Wow. Um, what have we been up to recently? Well, we just had a permanent win in the Supreme Court, which is a very nice thing to have to say. Uh, I'll just go into that real quickly. Um, because it really, these, these court cases really kind of show you what we do. American Atheist is the Marines of the free thought movement, which means we fight the fights that have to be fought even if they're unpopular. Even if stones are thrown at us from within the movement, we fight the fights that need to be fought. For instance, the state of Utah had a law. No roadside memorials. That's fair. Then they changed the law. They said, okay, we're going to allow roadside memorials, but only for fallen troopers. That's fair. And then they said, the only memorial that we're going to allow for fallen troopers is a 12 foot tall steel cross. <laughs> you laugh, but here's the kicker. The reason that they only allowed the 12 foot tall steel cross, period. If the cop was Jewish, he got a cross. If the, crop, if the cop was Muslim, he got a cross. Why? Because according to the state of Utah, the cross is not a Christian icon. It is a secular icon. And since it's a secular icon, you can put it anywhere you want to on public land without worrying about equal access or the separation of church and state. Ah, if you could put it on the, on the side of the road, you can put it in the schools. You can put it on the federal buildings. It's not religious. It's a secular cross. In other words, what they were doing was using dead cops as a shield so that they could start a precedent for the secularization of the cross so that they could put it anywhere they wanted to on public land. How do I know that that's true? If that weren't true, they would have put the crosses on private land. Or they would have allowed people to put up different monuments. Or they would have not used the cross at all and put up an obelisk. Three very simple ways to make American atheists go away. Three very simple ways to make it legal. Three very simple ways to really honor the cops and not to use the cops but they decided to use the cops. And so they fought us. How did they fight us? Oh, those American atheists are fighting dead cops. Where is your loyalty? These cops are dead. Not now, atheists. Shame on them. Shame on us. Listen, listen. I know you guys have your feelings, but not now. It's dead cops. That's what they do. That's what they do. They use the cops as a shield against the lawsuit. That's how they work. And believe me, it's not the last step. Whatever step the religious right is taking, it's never the last step. If you leave here with anything behind you, if you leave here with anything in your head, remember, whatever they're fighting for, it's not the last step. So we were the bad guys. And we were on television. And Fox News hated us. Oh, 
Fox News really didn't like us at all. Of course, when I went on Fox News, I caught Mr. Shirtleft, the, the, the Attorney General for the state of Utah, in lies on national television. Mm, but Fox News didn't really concentrate on that very much. They really concentrated on the fact that we were hurting dead cops. So, we fought, we won, they appealed, we won, we went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court turned it down. Years long battle, five years, we won the cross the second. We have a new major lawsuit at the World Trade Center. Some of you might have heard of it. You know, when you get a building that's made out of cross beams that falls, and hundreds of cross beams fall, some of those cross beams might actually survive the fall because they're made of metal, right? They're, they're welded steel, they're, they're durable. So lots of cross beams fell. They found one in particular. They took it, they straightened it. Did you know about that? They, oh yes, they straightened it, they trimmed it, they polished it, they carved Jesus on the top of it, they mounted it, they put it in front of a church for years. Then, without telling anybody, they moved it into the World Trade Center in a religious service held by a priest who said that this represented all people of faith. He consecrated the World Trade Center memorial ground and they put it in, in a religious service. And then they turned to us and said, that's not religious. That's not Christian. Right now, in the World Trade Center memorial, there is a cross that's 18 feet tall. This is a 10 foot tall ceiling about. So picture a cross in the World Trade Center, twice as tall as this building, with Jesus carved on the top of it, and they're telling you that it's not religious. That's a lie. It is. It's an attempt, clearly, to allow 9-11 to be seen as a Christian event. That's the point. That's illegal. It's also wrong. 500 atheists died on 9-11. 500. We want to be uh, acknowledged too. And it is our right. Now here's the point, okay? We're not demanding the cross be removed. That's not our right. Our right is for equality. So they can take the cross out or they can put us in. But they don't want to say it that way. They want to demonize us. They want to say, and they have said, tell me if this sounds familiar. Shh, atheists, not now. You're fighting against the people who died on 9-11. You're fighting against the families of the deceased. Now, we're fighting for the people who died on 9-11. We're fighting for those deceased, and we're fighting against those who would use those deceased people to Christianize 9-11 for their own political gain. It's disgusting, and it's not going to happen on our watch. Bring it. You bet. <laughs> So, what we're demanding is equality. And how they can give us equality is they can take out that religious stuff or they can put in a monument or a dedication for the atheists who died on 9-11. This doesn't seem too hard, right? Here we go. American atheists will pay for the display. American atheists will allow the World Trade Center board to pick the display, as long as it's not another cross, will be very agreeable. <laughs> they won't let it happen. In fact, we've gone even so far to say, okay, look, take one of your existing displays. American atheists will buy a plaque. We'll put it next to the display, and we'll dedicate that display to the atheists who died. It would cost nothing. It would make everything legal and fair. And it wouldn't even take up any space. We're still fighting against the people who died. Shh, atheists, don't do that. 
It's going to be a long, hard fight. We're going to win because we're right. We're going to win because we're right. So stay tuned on that. In Kentucky, they have a law. How am I doing on time? Good. In Kentucky, um, there's a state office of Homeland Security. Every state has a state office of Homeland Security. What do you think would be the number one job for the state office of Homeland Security? Might it be protecting the citizens from terrorism? Might be in 49 states, but not in Kentucky. No, you see, in Kentucky, the number one responsibility for the executive director of the State Office of Homeland Security is to publicize the fact that Homeland Security is impossible without the help of Almighty God. That's his number one responsibility. Number two is to protect us from terrorism, which of course is religious-based terrorism, which of course is anti-Christian-based, religious-based terrorism. In other words, we've got a bunch of people out there who hate Christians trying to start a war with us, and the first thing they do is say, Yay! We're Christian! Our God can beat up your God. That's how you start a war. That's not how you stop a war. That's how you start a war. It's also how you break the law. Because it is the only time that a, uh, a federal employee or a state employee is actually being compelled to deliver. Compelled and as part of his job description to deliver a religious-based message. It's illegal. We sued, we won, they appealed, we lost. And so we're appealing again to the Supreme Court. Now, the last, actually, we, we, they sued, we, we sued, we won, they appealed, we won, we, I'm sorry. <laughs> try it again, try it again, try it again. We sued, we won, they appealed, we lost, we appealed, and we lost again. Okay, so we've lost twice in a row. Both times we've lost twice in a row were to elected judges. So we're going to the Supreme Court because it's very clearly illegal. They're just pushing it up the ladder, and we're going to go to the Supreme Court on this one. Uh, and we have a Ten Commandments case in Florida. This is kind of nasty because what we have in Florida is a very, very wealthy religious group that's putting up Ten Commandments cases that are illegal, knowingly, everywhere, so that we can sue and drain our resources. They're trying to outspend us. They might succeed. They might succeed. It does work that way. They might succeed. Um, so if you have uh, any end of year donations that you'd like to give in, American Atheist is a 501c3 organization. We really could use your help on that one. Okay, so what else are we up to? You know, we're not only about lawsuits and making trouble for those pesky, uh, pesky atheists who want equal treatment. How dare we want equal treatment from our own government? Uh, what else are we up to? Well, that's a real picture. Isn't that great? I love that picture. That's a, the banner of atheism is patriotic, atheist.org, flying over the Statue of Liberty on the 4th of July. Because we have to bring in multiple advertising campaigns that make news and raise eyebrows. Remember, when we advertise, we're not advertising to the people who see the ad. We're advertising to the press. So that the press can say, woo, look at that. I'm going to put that in my paper. I'm going to put that in my article. I'm going to get some good readership on that. And then all those people read that. Nice picture, by the way, back there. <laughs> she, the, Lewis is the, uh, the person who actually took that picture, by the way. Uh, yes, it's a great picture. And by the way, uh, this picture is going to be featured in the upcoming issue of American Atheist Magazine. It's a beautiful magazine. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, so we work with campaigns with local partners to actually help build the grassroots campaign. Sometimes we put up our own billboards. Sometimes we do it with other organizations so that we can build coalitions and build strength at the local community. American Atheist has reestablished itself as the leader in hardcore atheism. Now, what is hardcore atheism? Hardcore atheism simply means 
vocal atheism. The atheism that doesn't take the crap because you want us to. We're not going to be quiet because you want us to. No. Religion is crap. And get it out of my face. Okay, so back to American Atheist Magazine. American Atheist Magazine is now on the shelves at Barnes & Noble nationwide. And I will tell you that we've been on the shelves now for two quarters, and sales for the second quarter doubled the sales for the first quarter. And that's pretty exciting because uh, what happens when you go in, you go into Barnes & Noble, you see American Atheist Magazine right there, you open it up, you see your local state director, you see your local organization, you see your, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> You see local state director, you see your local organizations with their websites, you, you, you see that you're a part of the organization. Again, it's all about raising awareness of the atheist movement to the, not to the atheist, uh, to the atheist at large. It's all about that. They walk into Barnes & Noble, American atheists, faces out right at them. Uh, we're going green with solar panels. That's happening right now. We're putting solar panels up on the on the roof of American Atheist. We will actually have a zero electric bill starting probably next month, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. The deep bigoting of America is something that I just wanted to touch on real quick. A lot of people tell me, okay, you know, how uh, how well is how how is it going? You know, we're fighting really hard. Do we really expect to win this? Do we really expect to be victorious here? Do we really expect to gain atheist equality? Oh yeah, we do. Now, this is one of the charts that I wanted to show you. And this is about the people who would vote for a presidential candidate, okay? And as you look, this is would they vote for an atheist candidate since 1937 up to 1912, up to 2012. And as you can see for the first time, yes, more than half the country would, in fact, vote for an atheist president. You can see a nice, solid trend up from, what, 18% to 49 to 54%, up 36%. That's a good trend, right? That's a good trend. But this is not the important number. Everybody, there was a, when this poll came out, there was a whole bunch of news about this number. And this is not the important number. This is where the important number lay, and this is the important number. 70% of the 18 to 29s would vote for an atheist. 70% of the younger generation would vote for an atheist. And that percentage, yeah. So what does that mean? Well, it means in 20 years, It'll be 70% of the under 50 group. Think about that. In, 70 per, in, in 20 years, our lifetime, 70% of the under 50 group, assuming there's no growth, assuming there's no spreading, 70% will be under 50. Do you think we'll be able to get elected then? I think we will. I think we will. 31%. Under 30 have doubts, and there's a 15% drop in certainty every year. They are getting it. Why are they getting it? Because of activism and communication. Communication, see that in the internet. That's why the internet is so important. When I was young, I was the only atheist I knew. I had to get on my bike, I had to ride two miles on my bike to the library and found the only atheist book in the library, The Case Against God by George H. Smith. Good book, started me going. But more importantly, that's what I had to do to find other people like me. This is not the case anymore. Because of the, because of the internet, it's impossible for an atheist to feel alone after only five minutes. You can go on to Facebook, go on to, uh, well, anywhere, just Google it. And you can find so many people just like you that you can't possibly feel alone. And that communication makes it easier to come out. That communication 
makes it easier to find the information and doubt more. And that's why the internet is such a valuable commodity to the atheist movement. 25% of this country is religiously unaffiliated. These people are our allies. That's 25% on our side. 25% on our side. Guess what? That's a force. Guess what? That's an organizational, an organizable force. 25% of the population, they're going to be listening to us now. The SSA is exploding. The Secular Student Alliance, they can't stop adding affiliates. Hundreds of affiliates. Boom, boom, boom. I don't know how many they have right now. Probably closer to 400. And the SSA is being led by uh, August Brunsman. And he's a great guy and he's a great leader. But he's not the reason for the explosion. The important thing here is that the SSA growth is a symptom, not a cause. The SSA growth is a symptom of the fact that the young people in this country are thirsting for an atheist movement. The atheists are everywhere in the young people. And they're thirsting for a movement. And that's why they're clamoring for the CFI on campus and for the SSA to give them something to use to spread the word to make sure that they have that they have a counted vote. So all the statistics are pointing in the right direction. Now, I'm going to, how much time? 15 minutes. I got 15 minutes. I'm going to show you a video. Okay? It's an eight minute video. Please bear with me. Does anybody here watch the McLaughlin group? Two people. Okay. Has anybody here heard of the McLaughlin group? Okay, a few of you. Those of you who don't, the McLaughlin group is a syndicated news program. It's been around for decades. I enjoy the show. It's a Sunday morning talking heads show, okay? And I like it because it's got lefties and it's got righties and you're going to see them. And it's not so much spinny as it is opinionated, okay? And it's, it's good and it's organized. I want to show you this video. It's eight minutes long. Please prepare whatever. I'm going to have audio real soon. Okay, I'm going to have audio real soon. Um, it's eight minutes long, and I wanted to show you this because we all have a confirmation bias. We all want to hear what we want to hear. If I have to get up here and tell you, yay, we're going to win, which I really truly do believe, you should say, yay, let's hear what the other side has to say. Because skepticism works. Skepticism is important even to this own, even in your view to our movement, you should be skeptical. So, please bear with me, watch this video as it goes blank. Okay, watch this video, it's eight minutes long, and listen carefully to what, uh, to what the lefties and the righties have to say. Or maybe not. Reason rally. Twenty thousand atheists showed up to celebrate non-believerhood. Reason. The self-described Woodstock for Atheists was co-organized by David Silverman, the president of American Atheists, an organization that protects the civil rights of atheists. Is President Silverman urging atheists to come out of the closet? The message is that if you can come out, you can come out. And if you can't come out, at least you'll know you're not alone. And maybe sometime soon, you'll be able to come out of the closet to your family. Of the 535 members in both chambers of the U.S. Congress, currently there is one, that's one, declared atheist. His name is Fortney Dillman Stock Jr., a.k.a. Pete Stock. Pete is a Democrat from California who has served consecutively since
since 1973. 40. He's now in his 20th term. His district, the 13th, is Alameda County, California's Bay Area. <laughs> Congressman Stock wins the election every two years with a bold mandate, if not a landslide. In the last election, 2010, he was re-elected with 72% of the vote. Question. The Secular Coalition for America claims that 28 atheists are in the U.S. Congress. Though coalition does not name names, why are those atheists all still in the closet except for one, Pete Stock? I ask you, Pete. Well, I think that Americans realize that we don't really have the ability to hold our politicians accountable. In Congress, you get these districts where you win with 73%. And so for a lot of Americans, one thing that does keep them accountable is the idea that there are repercussions for your actions. I think that a lot of people think that if you don't believe in an afterlife, if you don't believe in eternal implications for what you do, that if you could just get away with stealing and ripping people off, and as long as you don't get caught, you're fine. I don't think somebody would trust somebody who didn't believe in an afterlife with so much power over them. So I think it is an you important You think we have the ideas to believe in an afterlife? Yeah, I mean, I think, you, and yes, I do. I don't think you do. You think you can yeah. do it? Don't, who, 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 and also, don't, don't confuse immorality and morality with atheism. No, and, and you can be yeah. perfectly moral. But it's hard to you trust. Can be, you can be, uh, Obviously moral, and you can be accepted as being a truly moral person and be an atheist, correct? Right. Like when you talk about public perceptions, uh, uh, religiosity is still a strong enough force. Are you sure? Are you sure? Sure. That people, if you want to talk about why we don't see more out of the clause than atheists in Congress, yes, yeah, because, because you lose votes. With you you think if you are an admitted atheist and you come out of the closet, you're not going to be real these, uh, Well, what, what's important here, John, is, 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 that, is that it's coming out of the clause in recent years, I believe, because of uh, Christopher Hitchens and various other best selling writing about it very boldly. Uh, people say, oh, you don't necessarily break into flame if you, if you announce that you're an atheist. So, as many young people, you should say you're an atheist, where they're really some My late husband was an atheist. Uh, but, 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 that, well, no, John told me he was an atheist. Yes, but he didn't like his mother to know who lived in Cleveland and played the organ in the Catholic Church every morning. So there are some people that you feel more comfortable. I think there's a, a, a false assumption that if you go to church and you profess a religion that you're somehow, you get a, a pass when it comes to morals and ethics, when in fact you can go to a website called Happy Atheist Forum Dot com, and they are saying that atheists need to change, change their image. Mm -hmm. They are seen as sort of this gloomy bunch when in fact they, they believe you should build a hospital instead of a church and you should help people in the mm -hmm. here and now. Isn't that a public uh, 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 political group? Uh, no, they're not political, but uh, I, I've been to, I went to a number of events with Tom, mm -hmm. humanist events, and there were a lot of former clergy in their numbers. Really? Yeah. Okay, the believers! ARIS, A-R-I-S, stands for the American Religious Identification Survey. ARIS. It works with a sample of more than 54,000 American adults. ARIS says traditional religions in the U.S have lost a sizable number of members 1990 to 2008. So here's the snapshot of where our religious bodies stand as a percent of the U.S. total adult population. Methodists comprise 5% of the U.S. adult population. Lutherans, 3.8%. Presbyterian, 2.1%. Episcopalian, Anglican, 1.1%. And the Catholic, Immigrants sustained membership, but the U.S. Church still fell to 25.1% of the population. The survey also found that those with no stated religious preference grew from 8.2% in 1990 to 15% in 2008. By the way, many Catholic Hispanic immigrants joined the U.S. Catholic population. 
but the Catholic population nevertheless dropped 1.1 percent despite the Hispanic influx. Do you want to speak to that? Well, uh, you're seeing uh, not just Hispanics, but uh, Africans. Many immigrants are populating our churches now at a faster rate than the old school uh, uh, families uh, whose younger folks are drifting away from organized religion. Uh, this this is giving the church a new life in America, I think, and it's affecting uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of our perceptions of the future of America. In order for immigrants, the Catholic Church would have lost one fourth of its membership in the last uh, last half century. Catholics are 25 percent of the population, John, but only one fourth of them attend church regularly. One in every ten Americans is a lapsed Catholic. You mentioned Methodists, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Presbyterians used to be the dominant force in America. They're 12 percent of it. Protestants, who were 99 percent of the country, are now at 50 percent and falling. Atheists are about 16 percent. People are shopping it's around. People are shopping around everywhere. They're changing religions. They're looking mm -hmm. for choice. It's like it's like the Starbucks. I think we see the Catholic numbers turn around because you go to mass, go to St. Mary's or Paco's, go to St. Bernadette's or St. John's, where I go, and you see a lot of families like mine with three, four, five, six, seven, eight kids. Hey, hey, question. Why will America have it first? Out of the closet, ages, present, kindly give me the year that you can. It would be after 2050, after mid-century. Uh, after the demographics uh, change, and I think religious identification is, is not going to be, well, after 2050, I'll go for 2080. I won't be around to be accountable, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> by, by 2080, everybody will be named Carney, Cuccinelli, or Muhammad. So I don't think it has to happen before the, the growing Catholic uh, bubble takes over the population. Uh, 2074. Uh, I'm not sure about the special election year, but sometime around there. But, uh, but one thing, you know, a uh, uh, church uh, attendance is going up among the more educated folks. This is an interesting yeah, program. The answer is 90 years from now, the turn of the century. Issue three, the war on drugs. Okay. Okay, so how did you like that part when they said that there would never be an atheist president? How did you like that part when they didn't say that at all? How did you like that part? When it, it used to be it'll never happen and it's now a matter of when it happens. How did you like that? How did you like the fact that nobody is saying that atheists are immoral anymore, even Pat Buchanan? <laughs> what I wanted to show you from that, I think I'm off, can you guys hear me? Yes. What I wanted to show you from that is that it used to be, not five years ago, not five years ago, that atheism was in vogue. It was a fad. It was a blip. And now everybody is seeing it as an inevitability. Everybody is seeing it as a when. No longer an if. Nobody is seeing this as an if. So your confirmation bias hopefully will be satisfied. I know mine certainly is, because even our opponents agree with us that eventually we're going to have an atheist president and it's going to be during the lifetime of some of the people in this room. We're going to win this, folks. <laughs> Young people are the least bigoted, and they're getting older, and the people who are more bigoted, unfortunately, they're dying off. Uh, the normalization of atheism is now a when, and not an if. And you can see religion being in a sheer panic, can't you? You can see them panicking. You can see them panicking about contraception regulation. You can see them panicking about legitimate rape. Trying anything to grasp on to something that they can hold on to, that they can use to, to, to galvanize their forces. It's just not working. We are becoming more prominent. That means we're less scary. More prominent, less scary. And that means that the only thing that can stop us now is our own apathy. Last words. Now, tomorrow is Blasphemy Rights Day. I tweeted this picture of myself uh, a couple days ago. It says, I don't want riots, I don't want murders, I deplore violence. 
but I will not be censored. Hashtag Islam is barbaric. This is because we need to preserve our right to blaspheme. Tomorrow is Blasphemy Rights Day. Blaspheme, blaspheme, blaspheme. But don't do it for the sake of blasphemy. You're doing it because your rights to do it are in danger. Right now, in, uh, in, in Pakistan and in Jordan, there are people in jail in Indonesia for doing minor blasphemy, stuff that you and I wouldn't consider blasphemy. In Indonesia, Alexander An is, is serving a two-year prison sentence. Two years for putting on his Facebook, God does not exist. When people think about blasphemy, people think about burning the Quran. That's not what it's about. Proclaiming atheism is the same kind of blasphemy that they want to stamp out. Proclaiming atheism is the kind of thing that organized religion will put you in jail for, does put people in jail for today. The stuff that we do every day is in danger. Really. The Organization of Islamic States pushes every year for a UN resolution making blasphemy illegal. It's real. And that's why tomorrow we're asking everybody to blaspheme. Whether it's simply tweeting that God, is not, God does not exist or putting up something more hardcore. You have the right to say what you want to say. Tomorrow, say it. Donate. Your movement needs you. Right now, we're exploding. We have a lot to do, but we don't have enough money to do it. It's the end of the year. American Atheists is a 501c3 organization. We need your money. We need your donations. Pennsylvania non-believers, you guys are 501c3. They need your money too. Guess what? You should donate to both. Don't just donate to one. In fact, FFRF is coming up here soon. Donate to everybody. The amount of money that you donate to the secular movement will go much farther than the amount of money that you donate to the Red Cross. Think about this. You donate $10,000 to the Red Cross, it's a drop in the bucket. You donate $10,000 to, to the atheist movement, that goes far. Lastly, our national convention is coming up. And I'm going to ask Teresa, who's coming up later, to show you the video because I'm out of time. But the national convention is coming up March 28th through 31st. Remember I told you that we've been doing it for 49 years. March, this, this upcoming convention is going to be our 50th anniversary convention. A.C. Grayley is going to be there. It's going to be his first time speaking in the United States in a very long time. But I think it's even cooler that we got J.J. French, the lead guitarist for Twisted Sister. <laughs> now that's going to be something you ain't heard before. <laughs> so come on over to, the, uh, to, to, to Austin in, in uh, March, of this, uh, this coming March. Um, tickets are on sale now. We're selling the tickets in the back. I want to thank Brian and Carl once again for having us in here and putting together this convention. Thank you very much for having me, and have a wonderful time during our first.